And so my nationalism never relaxes. And I start becoming more and more consumed by the desire for control precisely because control is so unattainable. Here, here, definitely, I don't look at indigenous people and say, what are my parasites to me? This is what Nietzsche would say. It's a different sense of power. And so... This is the kind of nationalism that is becoming globalized. I think we are increasingly living in societies which see themselves as surrounded by barbarians. The Muslims are out to get us. Even, so even if I was and a she living in an achieved colonial settler society like Australia or the US, suddenly I'm starting to embody a nationalism of an unachieved settler society because I feel globally that I'm surrounded. They're coming. They're coming by boats, the barbarians. The barbarians, as you know, never come by plane. They come by boats. And so that psychological impact is much more important. So... I think what we have today in the face of this unachieved colonial nationalism which emphasizes control, emphasizes anxiety, emphasizes the barbarian other, we get a cosmopolitan reaction of a nationalism which is really not nationalism, a cosmopolitanism, which has to say, down with the nationalist, down with the petty, sort of like, aim for control, I'm a universalist, I don't care about the nation, etc. And I think uh, the problem has been to try and recapture the witness of the nation, what the cosmopolitans do, in a sense, they throw away the nation as control and the nation as companionship. And maybe this idea of love of country then involves elements of how do we resuscitate, or how do we regain a sense of nation as companionship. And I think, to finish, with the specificity of Australian nationalism. I think Australian nationalism, despite being, as I said, achieved colonial nationalism and now unachieved colonial nationalism, has many points, specificities, which allow us to regain this sense of companionship. I think one of the crucial issues about nationalism as companionship is that the individual the nationalist accepts a sense of frailty. Uh, the nationalist who is out for control does not like to imagine themselves as frail. They like to be omnipotent. Frailty comes with witness. And I think one of the nice things about Australian nationalism is that it has always had an element of recognition of our frailty as human beings. I think it is unique in the sense in celebrating Australian nationalism celebrates human frailty in a way no other nationalism does, even in Anzac. I think you can take uh, the Anzac myth as a kind of universal myth in the sense of we humans are climbing the hill of life and we're going to be mowed down anyway. And as we are going to be mowed down, we've only got each other. And this, this sense that we're going to be mowed down anyway. This sense comes, I think, from an Australian tradition which also is linked to the inability to totally domesticate the landscape. Here there's always a recognition that I'm not so important. I'm not so omnipotent. Take it easy, mate. Whatever you do. And so, and you too. <laughs> and so... In this sense, I think we can recapture 
within Australian nationalism elements to emphasize and counter the moods of anxious, aggressive, colonial nationalism that we have today. Thank you. Thank you, Gasson Hart. I was just thinking about um, Ray Gator's delightful anecdote from the De Niro saga. Some years ago, I thought it might be interesting to explore Australian nationalism through its jokes, so I started collecting them by the thousands for a book that came was called The Penguin Book of Australian Jokes. Astonishingly, this was the first joke. It's astonishing because of the person who told it to me. There are two corpses on the Hume Highway. One is a dead kangaroo and the other is a dead politician. What's the difference? I said to Prime Minister Hawke, I don't know. He said there are skid marks before the kangaroo. <laughs> now I found that wonderful. The self-deprecation coming from an Australian Prime Minister. Imagine, Ray, how heartbroken I was to learn that the joke was an American joke. It originally took place on Route 66 where the dead animal was a skunk. <laughs> Marilyn Lake, your turn at the lectern. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's been interesting uh, listening to the previous two speakers. Now I must only take 10 minutes. Um, because both of them um, answered the question, nationalism, is it a problem, with a, a sort of yes and a no um, answer, which is also the line I'm going to take. Um, I was interested um, that Raymond talked about, wanted to differentiate uh, between, or spoke about nation on the one hand and country on the other, love of nation and love of country. And that's an interesting distinction, and within that distinction, I'm actually going to concentrate on the nation part, and I don't think they can be collapsed um, or exchanged for each other there. And um, Gassan talked about nationalism as control, a possibility of a control and companionship, and what a good thing it was to have um, the companionship of belonging to a nation. And it made me think about the conditions uh, for a sense of companionship, for feeling companionship uh, in terms of, of the nation. So uh, my answer then to nationalism, is it a problem, is indeed yes and no. And I also should say I speak as a historian, and one of the things that's interesting about this panel actually um, is that we come from quite different disciplinary perspectives. I was also made aware of that um, with an anthropologist and a philosopher, and I speak very much, I think, as a historian, and Andrew is a sort of historian sociologist. So I say yes and no as a historian um, because I think some very, and particularly I'm thinking about Australian nationalism, some very progressive reforms have been achieved here in the name of the nation, especially in Australia in the building of a democratic welfare state, a new society in a new world, organised around ideas of equality, of citizenship and opportunity, with manhood and womanhood suffrage, old age and invalid pensions, maternity allowances, a fair wage and decent working conditions, child endowment and unemployment benefits, all paid not from private insurance as in other places, but from the common pool of general revenue. The idea that unemployment benefits should be paid from the common pool of general revenue rather than from private insurance I think is a very Australian idea and it um, speaks to our name as the Commonwealth of Australia, uh, that idea of a Commonwealth which was very deliberately chosen by our founding fathers around 1900 and interestingly it was chosen also in emulation of that country that Alfred Deakin always liked to call the Great Republic that is the United States, um, that had been eulogised in James Bryce's famous book, The American Republic, uh, 
which had been published in 1888 and was used as a Bible by um, those who framed the Australian Constitution in the 1890s. But nation building rests necessarily on narratives of nation. Nations in that sense are historical um, imaginings, constructions, that work, of course, to exclude even as they also build solidarity. I was interviewed the other day by a German journalist about the Anzac book. Uh, She was doing freelance work for German newspapers and magazines. And she asked me, she said, what sort of weird nation, she said, was it, whose national day rested on an imperial war fought by colonial white blokes in a foreign country in support of the British ally autocratic Tsarist Russia. Yes, it is weird, I replied, especially as the battle in 1915, far from securing our nationhood um, as they would have it, in fact locked us even more firmly into the British imperial embrace, which I always like to think was nicely symbolised in 1915, this very same year, by the arrival in Australia that year of Ryder Haggard, an emissary from the Royal Colonial Institute who came out here to lay the basis of a grand new imperial settlement scheme following the war. But of course we know that Australia didn't secure its national independence and not, I think, its nationhood in 1901 or 1915. Indeed, we await our independence day still, which is why I think uh, Anzac Day um, serves as both compensation and displacement. National narratives, as I say, work to exclude even as they build conceptions of community. Much of my historical work on Australia has charted different conceptions of the Australian nation, whether its soldier settlement uh, after World War I, which envisaged Australia as an imperial yeomanry on the vast empty spaces of our continent, or whether it was Faith Bandler fighting for a racially inclusive nation, count us all as one, she said, in the referendum in 1967, or whether indeed it was white Australia declaring itself to the world, its bold utopian vision declared on the cusp of the 20th century, a vision in which democratic equality would be achieved, so they thought, through racial exclusion. Or whether indeed it's the Anzac legend advocating military experience in the name of now what is called an Anzac spirit, to animate, claiming that this spirit now animates all our greatest national achievements. The German journalist uh, put to me that overseas, uh, she said, um, overseas, she said, Australia was regarded as a blokey white man's country. And that if we held any ideas, we had always followed the United States several decades behind, she said, in espousing freedom as a value and in the fact that our freedom was tied up with the apparent large expanse of unoccupied territory. So she was suggesting we had no distinctive stories to tell, that we were a derivative country, and therefore, she said, if we gave up on Anzac Day, we would have nothing left. What else was there, she said, that could possibly hold us together? But no, I said, I protested being a nationalist. The idea that we are a derivative country belies our actual history as an exporter of radical ideas as well as of commodities and minerals. Australia, I said, invented all of these democratic ideas and we exported them to the rest of the world, including, I should add, the very uh, radical idea that women should have full political rights when um, Australian women achieved those political rights in 1902, 
We were, of course, the first nation to do so. And I think it's the only time historically when Australia has achieved a world historic first, a world historic first, overturning millennia of history everywhere else. So I said to the German journalist, this could be our story. Why don't you write about this story? And she said, no, you're a blokey country. (laughs) And there seemed to be a bit of a contradiction between her firm belief and what she saw on Anzac Day and hold the rifle while I have a piss, that, that image of Australia and what I was trying to tell her. But as I say, and um, one of my next uh, research projects is to work on, to do the research actually that takes us outside Australia, to know Australia better by going beyond Australia, and to look at its proud history of democratic innovation, which we have indeed exported to the rest of the world including I now have um, a notion, a fanciful notion, that the very ILO um, was founded in 1919 on the basis of the ideas of H.B. Higgins, um, our, the noble figure who presided over the arbitration court. But, of course, what's interesting about those democratic innovations, as I said before, um, is that they rested so much on a sense of a, a necessity, as it was perceived, of racial exclusion. The two were intimately entwined. And I think actually in terms of nations as you know, excluding or as companionship or whatever, um, if, you think of, if you look at the history of all leading welfare states, particularly, for example, the Nordic countries or Germany, you will find that racial homogeneity is central to their conception of nation. And it makes you wonder whether welfare states historically were made possible by uh, the racial homogeneity of those countries. So there was also then in, in our history this central idea from the, from the 1850s in some ways of the idea of equality of opportunity that was espoused continually in the 19th century and into the 20th century. And although equality of opportunity was only extended to white men at first, the very struggles that went on by women and non-whites to buy into, to achieve that extension of equality to themselves, I think are key definitive stories of our nation. Political campaigns in Australia were as often as not inspired by the ideal of equality, just as in the US their story, their national story, is about the idea of freedom, which is the story that Barack Obama um, invoked in his inauguration address. So I think as historical stories are so important to people's sense of nation, I think it's important to revive these uh, narratives, this historical knowledge. But, of course, I, I also think it's interesting that equality, of course, is a dangerous idea. If you have you know, politicians standing up and saying, you know, in the name of our great national tradition of equality, um, you know, that might raise all sorts of demands and questions. It might um, inspire people to decry the historically unprecedented gap we now witness between the rich and the poor in Australia and that has also um, that sort of outrage has also informed the criticism of um, the websites such as my school. If we actually spoke of equality as a basic Australian uh, historical value, it might indeed inspire new campaigns to achieve sexual and racial equality. I just want to conclude with a little story about Neil Mitchell on 3AW. Um, I uh, was interviewed by him yesterday morning um, and um, about the Anzac book, um, which he hadn't read, of course, um, <laughs> but he, he knew a lot of things about it. Um, and he, he asked me, which is a quite a common question um, you know, in the commercial media, he said, well, if you don't have, well, indeed, which is the question the German journalist asked, if you don't have Anzac Day, what, you know, there's sort of anxiety, what... What national day can we have? And I said, well, you know, on the one hand, maybe we don't need a national day. Britain gets by okay without a national day. 
Um, on the other hand, if we go to follow the New World societies, the great republics such as the United States, of course they have Independence Day because you know, they became independent, but they have a variety um, of national days. And I found this when I was teaching at Harvard, actually, because my classes were on Mondays, and so half the Mondays in the calendar were wiped out because you know, I stumbled over the Martin Luther King Day in February. You know, they have Independence Day, they have Thanksgiving, they have Labor Day as a public national holiday in the United States. And, 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 of course, they have a Veterans Day. Um, and so I said to Neil Mitchell, well, you know, maybe we, we, we could have, you know, a number of days that uh, commemorate different aspects of our community, of our history, of our experience. Um, and he clearly didn't like that idea very much. And I, as I was driving to La Trobe, I listened to the talkback um, that followed this uh, interview, and I heard him say... Um, you know, what a crazy idea that was, he said, because next um, you'll be having a special day to celebrate lesbian vegetarians. Now, I thought that was really interesting as an idea about um, <laughs> companionship, actually, and our sense of companionship that the nation um, offers some people. Um, and you know, it was an idea about the group that was furthest away from his sense of companionship, that he couldn't imagine feeling any sense of companionship if there were a national day to commemorate lesbian vegetarians. <laughs> um, it was clearly in his mind, you know, the most ludic ludicrous claim. So, um, yeah, I want to leave you with the idea. I mean, it's the idea about control and companionship or about belonging and not belonging. Um, and the ways and you know and the ways in practical purpose this, this of course is tied to conceptions of national days um, and uh, how national days recognize that sense of companionship that some people feel thank you thank you marilyn lake and finally andrew marcus Thank you. I'm approaching this um, issue of nationalism um, more as a social scientist and with a very practical bent. I've always regarded nationalism as many faceted, always politically contested, and with commonalities and differences across a population. So in the brief few minutes that I've got with you, I'm going to talk about Australian public opinion and particularly as it relates to immigration issues. Immigration issues are central to a nation. It's immigration that defines who's in and who's out, who's part of the national, national entity. First of all, asylum issues. And just walking around the campus, um, I've seen some posters uh, you know, outraged at the response of the Rudd government um, to the way that the asylum issue was politicised. Well, on the one hand, it makes sense to be outraged, but on the other hand, it, we also need to understand the political marketplace. What happens in the political marketplace when one segment um, of politics chooses to politicise an issue and when sections of the media decide that uh, the asylum issue is the most significant issue in the country and is worthy of uh, front page coverage day after day after day, as if there was no significant issue other than that in the country. So what do we know about how the public reacts to asylum issues? Well, we know from international polling that attitudes to asylum seekers tend to be very negative. Asylum issues are ones that cross the demographics, cross demographics of age group, income, education, in finding high levels of negativity. In Australia around 2001, it was a highly politicised year, uh, opinion polls indicated that 50 to 60% of the population favoured 
sending the boats back, whatever that might mean. It actually doesn't mean very much. Uh, but that notion um, will get majority support. Polls were conducted in Australia over the last month. Um, some very badly worded, uh, some asking leading questions, but nonetheless reinforcing the notion that maybe three to one within the Australian public favour the notion of sending them back as opposed to giving asylum. The most recent poll uh, in the Australian asked, what's the best thing to do with asylum seekers? And by a majority of two to one, uh, the respondents favoured the liberal approach, which was a very tough stance. In exploring the issue of nationalism, I try to get a sense of the distribution of opinion within the Australian public. Recently, we've had much discussion about racism in Australian society, particularly in the context of um, attacks on overseas students. And people have asked, you know, Australia a racist society, not a racist society. To me, it's a nonsensical approach. The essential issue is what proportion of the Australian population is seriously intolerant, seriously bigoted. And by looking at polls over a period of 20 or 30 years, because opinion does not change radically on such issues, we find that about 10% of the Australian adult population is seriously intolerant. A similar number is actively tolerant, and most people, 80%, are in the middle. The proportion tending to intolerance, the ambivalent and the seriously intolerant, comes to about 45%. So we live in a country which is not unusual, but we live in a country where there is the electoral basis for the politics of race. And here we're talking about quite an unsophisticated approach to issues at the level of headlines, simplicities, but up to 45% of the Australian electorate can be attracted to that form of politics, to that form of nationalism. So politics being the art of the impossible the Rudd government had to make decisions about which battles it will fight, meaning in which areas it will challenge, and in which areas it will essentially accept and downplay and go and take the easy route. Now, our present government has very clearly decided on now on the asylum issues, having attempted a reform decided that that was not an issue that it could continue to lead or to fight. Similarly, have you heard much about multiculturalism? Nothing. Next to nothing. We have debates which are about numbers, population capacities, but not about uh, fundamentals to do with, say, national character and the impact of immigration on national character. This is the approach that this government has taken, cognizant of the reality of the electorate and what is marketable and what is very difficult. We can identify the segments of the population that are most open to pluralism, to diversity. The people aged 18 to 34, Employment status, most likely to be a student. Education level, people with a bachelor's degree or higher. Financial status, prosperous. Occupation, professional. Country of birth, non English speaking background. Likely to vote? Green. Which is a bit of a contradiction. Because Greens, on the other hand, on the one hand, are environmentally very conscious. On the other hand, given their set of values, are most open to liberal immigration policies. So we need to understand the segments of the population and how various 
presentations of nationalism, the marketing of nationalism, will appeal differentially in different sectors of the Australian population. And just as a last point, to understand that, that what we have with regard to the issues we're talking about today, senses of national identity, issues that will not recede, but will be with us and will continue to be with us. Because the way that the modern societies are developing, and as you've heard, there are much greater opportunities for people to choose, people to determine their identities, people to determine their interactions. Now, we all know the issue of population growth, the huge increase in population. Over the last 12 months, the Australian population grew by 431,000 people. 431,000 people, or 2.1 per cent. Of that, about one third was natural increase and two thirds was a result of immigration or people gaining temporary residence in Australia. So these issues which are now developing, and I just highlight two. One of these issues is that increasingly we have people in this country who have long-term visas but not permanent residence, not the rights to full equality. That form of Australian nationalism that, was, that Marilyn talked about, the turn of the 20th century, a land of equals. We now have 1.4 million people in this country, 1.4 million, which is nearly 10% of the adult population who only hold temporary visas and have not got the rights of full citizenship. And the other issue is that the possibilities that people now have to embrace multiple identities, to withdraw in many respects from the mainstream of society and to interact with nationalisms not found in Australia or not developed in Australia but may have find their homes elsewhere. So the capacity for people to choose, to determine, to opt out, and the impact of this on the future of Australian society 20 or 30 years down the track. Thank you.